leadership has become incredibly complicated. Workplaces are being disrupted in ways we never could have imagined. So what's the biggest challenge to leadership? I'm Michelle Johnston, management professor, executive coach, and leadership expert. And I believe the biggest challenge for today's leader is connection. Why? Because research shows that connection drives results. That's why I've written the book, The Seismic Shift in Leadership, and why we are putting together this podcast series. Through interviews with some of today's top business leaders, we are going to explore how leaders' ability to connect with themselves, their teams, and their organizations defines their ultimate success or failure. Now, on to today's episode. Welcome to the Seismic Shift Podcast. I am so excited today to have one of my favorite Saints players. I've been following him for years since he was on the Super Bowl team with the New Orleans State Saints. Welcome, John Stinchcomb. Hey, Michelle. Thanks for having me on today. Oh, thank you so much for being with us. As you know, uh, this podcast is all about connection and what's happening in the workplace right now, whether it's for NFL teams, NBA basketball teams, nonprofit organizations, corporate entities, there is a seismic shift happening. And what I'm trying to do is deconstruct it. What does it mean? What does it look like? And from a leadership perspective, how do we as humans best connect with our people right now? Because it's a whole new era of work. So what I want to dive into, John, is what your experience was like with the New Orleans Saints football team as an offensive of tackle on the Super Bowl team with Drew Brees. So give us a little bit, a bit, a bit of background and share your story, and then I'll dive in with particular questions. Sure. Well, I'm so fortunate because every step of the way, whether it was in, in the home and growing up in high school, collegiately, I played at the University of Georgia. And then obviously when I get drafted to the Saints, I was surrounded by great leaders. Great leaders, you know, started in the home. I had Four parents who were divorced, and uh, they imparted each one of them these qualities and these assets that became invaluable throughout my life. And then you flash forward to the New Orleans Saints, and you, you look back and think, man, I'm so grateful for the great leadership that I experienced to get me to this point, but also the role that it played on that team. You know, it were the best football team in the world for that year. Pretty awesome statement. Sounds good to my ears every time I say it. And I'm grateful for the leadership of not only the coaches or the uh, administration to put everything together, but some of the players that were in that locker room that were vital. Uh, you know, obviously Drew Brees comes to mind for all of us when we think of that Super Bowl season. But there are others that, you know, whether they were vocal or through demonstration in their actions, we had a locker room full of truly exceptional leaders. And, you know, that's why we were able to take, you know, that good team to that great team to an elite season for all of us. Oh, well said. So you talk about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also always trying to deconstruct kind of the secret sauce of leadership, right? What does leadership look like and, and sound like and act like and feel like? So when you said there were a number of exceptional leaders in that locker room during that season that got you to, to become the world's best football team in, in the 2009-2010 year. So what, what is leadership, what does it look like to you? Uh, it starts with relationship, right? I think, you know, I win a Super Bowl, but only a few years prior to that, you know, that regular season, the Super Bowl, we went 13 and three. Five years prior, we go three and 13. So what explains that kind of turnaround? And I think it is, one, the character of the locker room, the the overall quality, you know, not not ability to play football on a football field, but just the, the character in that locker room was raised. I think that was one of the main driving factors of what Coach Payton as well as General Manager Mickey Loomis were looking for. Is We're looking for high-quality caliber folks 
that can buy in to, to this vision. And so in addition to good leaders, we had a room a full of, for lack of a better word, followers and guys that can buy into the system and, and support that vision and that mantra that you adopt. So, you know, in the locker room, your exceptional leaders uh, like Jonathan Vilma and Drew Brees and Scott Fujita uh, along the offensive line, we're a tight bunch. And so we had a cross section of, of veterans, but yet younger players that all, you know, we, we challenged each other. You had the accountability, you had the encouragement but it all the underlying uh, foundation for everything that that happened that season was relationship. And that is it. If I'm going to pick one word that is vital and in contrast to those seasons where we struggled, um, it's relationship. It's that ability to connect even when, you know, we are a diverse cross section of people. Right. I'm Michelle, just thinking about this offensive line. You have uh, an unheralded um, free agent pickup who, you know, is from small town South Carolina. You have a, a kid from a younger player who's from Bloomsburg who doesn't come with the blue, you know, seal of pedigree of distinguished, exceptional play. Uh, you have a kid who uh, really had a, a rougher background and talented, but uh, challenging personality from Northern California, uh, you know, a suburban white guy from outside of Atlanta in Georgia. I mean, we're from everywhere, every walk of life, but yet we love each other to this day. And I would consider them my brothers and you can rely on them. And in those moments that were challenging that season, the relationship that we created, that commonality that we found uh, allowed us to face challenges together and really push and encourage one another and hold each other accountable when, you know, it was hard because you know, being successful, finding, I think of Steve Gleason, you know, f famous New Orleans Saint. Uh, if it's not Drew Brees, folks will know who Steve Gleason is because of his exceptional leadership. And his mantra is awesome ain't easy. And he's right in trying to do things that are awesome they're not always easy. And being able to uh, be a part of a group that you challenge one another um, and you hold each other accountable, it creates a special opportunity for greatness. Oh, you are so right. So when I think about relationship, I think about, I call it connection, right? True, meaningful connection. And to me, you have to have that trust and you have to have psychological safety. So those are some of the dimensions and I think about kind of the secret sauce of what makes a great team in order, you have to have that trust, you have to have that safety, and you have to, of course, like you said, work so hard, hard because what'd you say, awesome ain't easy? Is that, awesome is that easy. Steve Gleason's awesome ain't easy? I love that. I re just remember his mantra, no white flags, when he was diagnosed with ALS and he's still fighting the good fight for sure. So awesome ain't easy. So really hard work and dedication to your craft and in the locker room, really focusing on that relationship and you call them brothers to this day. So one when, when I interviewed Luke McCowan for, um, to understand what it was like to serve as backup quarterback to Drew Brees, like what exactly did Drew Brees do in the locker room to build that connection. And one of the examples he gave me, John, is he said at the beginning of training camp, or maybe it was the beginning of off season, he took out a notebook like this one and asked for everybody on the offense, what are your personal goals? What are your professional goals? I'm going to write them down. I'm going to tell you what my personal goals are, right? To be the best husband I can to Brittany and the father of to my four kids, right? And here are my professional goals. It's not just about getting to the Super Bowl, but here's what I'm trying to work on to be better quarterback. And then he went through it throughout the season. Even if a player was, you know, he knew that he probably wasn't going to be long on the team and probably would be cut. It didn't matter that you were a part of the team and the offense. So could you give me any more examples of, so that p listeners listening, in on this podcast are like, okay, well, I want to build a team. I want to be exceptional. Awesome ain't easy, but what do I do? 
Uh huh. Well, it, w what's exceptional is it's authentic. For Drew, it wasn't just, hey, I read it in a book. Let me see what your goals are. He authentically, I, you know, I read the excerpt from Luke McCown in your, in your seismic shift book of, and I remember those times. I remember Drew asking each individual, what are your goals? And he wasn't doing it just because he's the quarterback and that's what he's supposed to do. He cared. And that authenticity rings true for all of us when, you know, we all have that BS meter, right? For the folks that want to be leaders and then those that are leaders. And for Drew, especially in that preseason, he cares. And I think that care and compassion builds the trust that is necessary for somebody to follow you. If, if Drew's going to be our leader, I want to be able to trust and, and have that certainty that he cares that, you know, when I tell him what my goals are, that that matters to him and not that he just, you know, listen to it and be like, all right, well, good luck with that. And you're on your own. But I think one of the main reasons he would do it is because he was trying to help you succeed. He was trying to help you reach those goals that you set and not just hear them and have you say them, but how can I plug into that for you? So as a leader, you know, it's often said to me and, you know, I'm involved in leadership at my church. And one of the things that we talk about is people need to know how much you care before they care how much you know. So it's not just a head knowledge and an understanding of your craft or your position or whatever else. They need to know that each individual, that they matter to you as a leader. And I think you know, the very first time Drew comes, he's a he's a free agent from San Diego. And there's concerns about his shoulder as to whether he'll be healthy enough. Boy, what a, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm grateful that Miami, the Dolphins were in the running for him and they were concerned about his shoulder. I'm glad their concerns were a little bit uh, more significant than the Saints who are willing to take a chance on a future Hall of Famer. But one of the first opportunities we had to really bond um, as a team and, you know, Coach Payton was new. We're trying to create a new culture and identity among the team. Um, we went on a uh, across the, the lake there in New Orleans. We went to go play paintball as a team. And I distinctly remember not knowing Drew very well. And on the way over, he's talking about, you know, The Last of the Mohicans, the movie, and Magua and what, all these all these characters. And he's trying to connect with each player and form schemes of, like, how we're going to attack. And, you know, and you just think this guy is a natural leader. He's trying to find that connection piece, how to relate, and also sees an opportunity and doesn't wait for someone to say, hey, this is how what we're going to do and how we're going to, to break it out. But sees that, you know, even if it's paintball, we're going to set each other up for success. And, you know, I want us to to find that victory in paintball and, you know, is, is finding those relatable pieces. So for some folks, it just comes natural. And for others, we have to work at it more. But recognizing that uh, you, you build that trust with uh, caring about folks and, and then it matters. I'd also say this, Michelle, I've had other leaders that don't have that authenticity that may, you know, want to be leaders. They want that recognition and that responsibility, but they don't take care of their own responsibility first. So it undermines everything that they try to do in leadership. So, you know, let's stay with Drew for a little while here. Drew would be the, the you know, during the season, most days our first meeting starts at eight o'clock and that's kind of when our day starts. If you're injured, you have to come like an hour, an hour and a half early. So you could be there as early as 630, especially if you want to watch some film beforehand. And I could guarantee you that during the season, no matter what time you show up, your car in that player's parking lot won't be the first one there. It was always Drew. And it, that just shows his commitment to his craft, right? So not only does he care about you, but he's taking care of his responsibilities along the way and doing it at an excep exceptional rate. So for the rest of us looking to him for leadership, 
he's setting that standard of not only am I taking care of my own responsibilities, but I'm also uh, putting others first and, and putting the, the team before, you know, the everything else that he's sacrificing, which is sleep and time with his family and relaxation time and social time. So it was a constant for him. And he embodied it from the time he woke up to uh, when he retired of team first and everyone on that team could recognize it. Long answers, Michelle, oh, just bear with me. Things. Those are, I love them. Thank you, John. I love the paintball example because I really believe, particularly as, as I'm talking with so many leaders who are leading people who might not be in the office every day. And I read one of the articles this relates to, I read an interview with you um, when you were trying to give your opinion of the Saints football team during covid when you don't have time in the locker room together. Do you remember that the off season, they, they, they weren't allowed to come in. So, so the question is, how do you build trust? How do you build teams when you're not together, right? Whether it was COVID or whether now your employees are saying, I really want to work from home. I value the flexibility. And, and so one of the things that I loved about your paintball example is I'm, I'm, I'm advising leaders saying, okay, if your employees are saying, I still really want to work from home right now. And, and then at least schedule once a month, a time for you to get together and do something, whether it's just breaking bread and having lunch and sharing some appreciation and some wins and maybe some team collaboration, strategic planning. Great. Do it. Or go and play paintball together. Do something to add a little bit of laughter and levity. I also love the, the paintball example because you're so right. Drew's not only trying to connect with each other, but he's also is like, we've got to win and we've got to figure out a competitive strategy to win paintball because that dude's competitive. <laughs> <laughs> That's an understatement, Michelle. And I, I think you're right. I think you're looking for ways to connect outside of just, you know, boss to employee or whatever that relationship looks like for the folks listening to this podcast podcast in their world. I think, you know, I look back to every Thursday night and during the season as an offensive line, we would go to dinner and it was to build that camaraderie, to build that relationship so that when we do go back to work, that I, I know you better. I know, and you know me better. I mean, as as a even as a veteran, or when I was a young player, there's relationship there, and I start caring about that individual more, and that matters. Now, Drew would come to those those dinners, and he would usually Michelle be the last one there, and it's not because he was being rude or dismissive. He would still be at the facility working. We would have gone home, changed clothes you know, kissed our wives, said hey to our kids, and then gone to dinner. And he would still be game planning with the coaches and, and putting team first, but also prioritize that relationship and connecting with the guys to the point where he's leaving straight from the facility to come join us on a on a Thursday night. So again, a, an example of him not only taking care of his responsibility, building connection with the rest of those, the, his players and, and the guys that are under his leadership, but also recognizing the importance of relationship and, and that connection of it's a priority. It needs to happen. Um, you know, I, I wasn't a part of a team during COVID, but there was an off season where there was a lockout and it was, you know, we're negotiating the collective bargaining agreement and, it wasn't the usual off season where the team gets to come together and you're um, introducing the rookies to the the culture of of how we go about our business, and we had to create on our own different ways of that connectivity. So, a few of us would meet at Tulane and and try to get on the field and work on you know as an offensive lineman we're going through our calls and making those. Um, those connections and working through drills and trying to prepare for the season, but it wasn't something that was mandatory or mandated by our coaches and the staff above us. As leaders, we were trying to find ways to connect with, you know, the rest of our team and our group that we're responsible for because the performance 
is is still expected to meet that certain level of expectation of excellence that that we want on a given Sunday. So you had to go out of your way and some guys couldn't make it. You know, some guys were were still at home training. And so, you know, this was predated the Zoom, but we would be on the phone and kind of going through plays and you find ways to connect that aren't, you know, your standard orthodox ways, but recognizing that these are going to be guys on our team or in our in our group on the offensive line that we're going to need to count on and we can't wait until we're all together when it's mandatory to to start building some of the foundational pieces that that are required for success you are so right. I also, I love your example of meeting for Thursday nights for dinner. And so a lot of the leaders, I'm, I'm also an executive coach. And so I pester my leaders like, okay, what are you doing to connect with your team to show that you care about them as people, not just the results that they bring to your organization? And they'll say, but Michelle, wait, you're telling me in my team meeting that I have to go around and ask how they are and I have to know their children. And I, and I said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And, and so, and, and I try to recommend the strategies of, okay, yes. Yeah, so why don't you all go out to lunch once a week? That would be great. Oh, we don't have time for that. But that's what you're saying is those Thursday night dinners. That's when you really build the trust and the psychological safety. And you really do care about each other as full humans because you get to know about their family families, your families and your vacations. It's so much more than just business. And that's what I'm, so are there any other um, things that you all did as a team and think about that Super Bowl year, you know, that, that got you to that high performing level that you needed to be with that trust, that safety, so that you could be the world champions. Any other strategies so that our listeners can say, okay, I can do that. I can bring my, I can bring my, my team to paintball. I can have weekly dinners. What else? could they do? Yeah, I mean, obviously events are are something, but they're usually singular and uh, singular in a week or, or recurring. But I think the biggest difference is when folks n- just know you, get to know you. And obviously those events and the, and the dinners is to create an opportunity. But I let me be honest with you, Michelle, I've seen those opportunities squandered as well. When I first came to New Orleans, those it was almost torturous to go to those meals because there were strong personalities in that room that didn't get along very well and there wasn't an effort to connect it was we're just doing this because we think we should well that was a flawed approach it you know we weren't getting the benefit and it became torturous so as a leader in a group the the point needs to meet, remain the point. We're not going to dinner just so we can have dinner. It was to build relationship, to build that connectivity and and have that community because when, you know, I hate to say this, Michelle, at times in a football, either on a football field or in the locker room in a practice field, uh, some folks will yell at you and get after you. And, you know, I don't know if that's happening in the office place, but there are times when, you know, your boss is is on you and trying to motivate you to do more. And if you don't have that relationship, that relation, that connection that's been built, you're like, who are you? You don't know me. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know why, you know, I'm struggling in this space. And, and you start flipping it around and saying, well, you don't do this and you don't, you know, you, why don't you sweep behind your own back door? Because you're, you have these problems. But if, if someone knows, you know, my wife or my kids and they can call them by name, if they say, you know, my son is Mason, my daughter's Emily Gray, and they start saying, you know, hey, how's Emily Gray doing? Because wasn't she, you know, in dance class and have whatever those issues are, all of a sudden I think you care about me. So that next time that you rip me, you know, and say get on my case for not performing the way that uh, we were expecting, then I, I, I at least know that you care about me to that point where I can take some of that. And I don't immediately put up my shield and say, hey, 
I, I may have not done great, but here are the reasons why. And here's why you don't have that platform to criticize me. So, you know, the, the events are great, whether they're recurring or not. But the relationship that that caring aspect that builds the trust, I think, is is foundational and the reason why you do uh, those singular events. Oh, I love that. And that's a good segue to talk about the Saints organization at large, because it's one thing that you all as a team, you know, you break bread together, you do activities together and really try to work on on true authenticity and care for the whole person. There's got to be something, a secret sauce that the Saints organization was doing also to promote this culture. Can we talk about that? What do you think it was? Yeah, and and I'll, I'll say exactly where it started, Michelle. It started with the culture and identity in that locker room. And having played when I first got drafted to the New Orleans Saints for three years, uh, my brother was playing for the Oakland Raiders at the time when I get drafted, and we would compare stories, and it was almost like we played in the penal league because, you know, talented players, but not the great pe- greatest of people. And, uh, you know, it was stories you were going, you'd shake your head, and if I told some of them, you know, you're thinking there's probably some legal uh, implications in some of it and just some low quality um, character flaws. And so when Coach Payton came and when Mickey Loomis, who I give, and, and, and Mr. and Mrs. Benson, I give them a ton of credit of recognizing uh, not only ability should be a factor, but also who I have in our team, who I have in this locker room, who I have in this organization. That really matters. And I think that really became one of the pivotal pieces that they're looking at of before we even build, before we even talk about X's and O's and plays and and what we want to do on the field, it matters who we're bringing into the room and how they fit. Um, When I got done playing in 2011, I start calling Saints preseason games. And, you know, I'm familiar with the organization and, you know, some of the guys are, especially early on, former teammates. So I, I know a lot of their character. And there was a few years where, you know, you, you're excited when you have the DeMario Davises and the Cams and guys that you know care about more. But there were some years where, I mean, just by who was named a, a team captain that you're going, you're scratching your head and say, I know that guy. I know what he's about, and that's not a good direction. It also happened to, not so coincidentally, align very similar with that lull and that dip in the Peyton era where they didn't find that same success. That's not a coincidence. It is a direct correlation of the character and the in the environment that you create that then carries on to the performance of your entire group. So before you even start building those relationships, getting the right building blocks and those pieces in the room was vital. And then recognizing at at some point, you're like, you know, the ratio is off. We don't have enough strong leaders to guys that are, are talented, but not the type guy we want in this locker room to lead us, that we need to make an adjustment. And that's in our culture and less about you know their ability to execute X's and O's. It was more about culture. And that is a huge piece of why the Saints have been able to maintain success for a long stretch and then recognize when they hit that dip of, of what needs to change. Gosh, I couldn't agree with you more. Just as a fan on the outsides, reading about some of the potential um, trades or draft picks. And I and, and I would read about and I would say, oh, gosh, please, please, please don't draft that person. Please don't get that person in the trade. If there if there was something, a, a character flaw that I was like, that doesn't seem like a really good person. And I knew enough about Sean Payton and Mickey Loomis in the locker room of what they were trying to build. And you're right. It starts with character. And, and to Mario Davis and Cam Jordan, to me, are just two of the finest humans right now on that team. Oh, without question. And I and it's echoed through the identity and culture that they've created. And when you have strong leaders, let's be honest, Michelle, they're not all choir boys. You know what I mean? You're not going to have 53 just perfect character individuals. 
but there's a ratio, right? And you know, it's the 10, 10, 80 rule where you know, you've got 10 really strong positive leaders and you have 10 that aren't and 80 is pretty much the folks in the middle that are looking to be swayed. And you know, that's not a, a direct percentage, but once that starts tipping, once you have, you can have a couple of guys that maybe aren't the best, right? Character wise, but they are a part of a culture that, that they're challenged and they can still be a part of it, but aren't influencing the overall mass in a way that is negative. And once you get one or two or three of too many of the uh, influencers that aren't positive, then then you it, and it happens, in my opinion, what I've seen, it happens really quick. And that culture gets soured and tainted and, and can turn on you uh, a lot quicker than than you can build it back. And so being able to address that early on when you see it and recognize that shift that it's very important because once you lose that culture, it is hard to get righted. And uh, having experienced it, I mean, I, honestly, when we switched from, and I enjoyed thoroughly playing for Coach Hazlitt, when we moved from Coach Hazlitt, his head coach, to Coach Payton, the, the primary focus that he was uh, really drilling into was trying to change the culture of an organization. It was not easy to do. It was painful. I can attest because I went through it. And you'd much rather try to keep it and, and make small adjustments to maintain it than try to totally shift an entire culture and create something new because uh, you have a lot of folks that are stuck in their ways. And, and some as you add new pieces, they're looking around the room to try to figure out you know, how, what is our identity? What are we about? How are, what's our culture as a, as a company or organization? I love that. And so the, so Sean Payton comes in and I saw that you started in 2006 and one of my significant positive life moments was being in the Superdome, the reopening of the Superdome for the 2006 game against the Atlanta Falcons. And you know, it's interesting, Jim Mara is also in my book and he was the coach of the Falcons during that game. And he confessed to me, he goes, oh yeah, I knew we were gonna lose that game by the energy in the Superdome. Tell us oh, about was, that game. Yes, so it was 11 Falcons versus 70,000 Saints fans in the dome, much less all the millions of people that were watching and, and cheer. It is by far the most single-sided uh, special environment that I've ever been a part of. And, you know, that, that takes into account the Super Bowl, but there's a lot of corporate uh, ticket holders that are in that stadium. And there's times where, you know, there, there's plenty of Colts there that are cheering for their, uh, the Indianapolis to, to win. And so being in the Superdome filled with nothing but Houdat Nation, and it was an incredible an environment. It, the best sports uh, environment and feeling that I've ever been a part of, and also the marquee moment for Steve Gleason that you know is is forever galvanized by that statue outside the the Superdome. So. A truly yes, special, where Steve I mean, what an awesome right. memory. Yes, you're right. So Steve Gleason, so the beginning is Green Day and you 2 I remember. I mean, I still get chills thinking about that event. So Green Day, U2, um, and then Steve Gleason blocking the kick, and then touchdown, and then the momentum, and just tears. And, and because you all represented at that time, and for those of you who are listening who are not super familiar the reopening of the Superdome in 2006 was after Hurricane Katrina. So not only, and there are a lot of hurricanes and natural disasters, this one was pretty bad, right? And the Superdome had been used as a last resort and a refuge for all of these New Orleanians who had lost their homes. And so it represented such gloom and doom. And then all of a sudden the reopening and the saints and we win. And I just feel like that gave us as a city, the galvanized is a key word. It just, you all represented hope. You gave us hope in a time where we needed hope. And so we'll, we'll end on, on that connection for the listeners. 
um, my book, The Seismic Shift in Leadership, is about how important connection is right now in 2020, 20, 2023 to lead. And it's connection with yourself, which is authenticity and showing up in order to show care and compassion to others, right? Connection with your team in order then connection with the organization to really have alignment and make sure that your team, in this case, that John Stinchcomb was on in the Saints is aligned and moving in the same direction. So what I think that, that the Saints did so well and the city did so well is it just brought us together as New Orleanians and gave something gave us hope. And I just want to thank you for that in a time that we needed it. I think that that New Orleans is better at connection than than any city that I've ever lived in. And and whether it's because we have all of these right now, we're in, we're in the middle of Mardi Gras. So we're coming together and we have all these opportunities to connect with one another. And then it's going to be Jazz Fest. And then it's going to be Saints preseason. And then it's going to be the Pelicans. And, and so for the listeners, I really want you to think about when you think about connection, think about you as a leader, how you're showing up as a human and how you're really trying to connect with others as a servant leadership to model the way, what John shared with us about Drew Brees, right? It's gotta be authentic. You gotta show that 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 you have a responsibility to yourself and to your team. And then he also talked about at the organizational level, right? The Mickey Loomises and then the coach of how important culture is. And it's about relationship and showing up and breaking bread together and adding laughter. But overall, the big theme that I've heard from John is it really is about showing that you care about each other and not just that you're checking boxes, right? So connection at the end of the day is it's a shared experience that we have together. This is just a tough time in general um, to just to be a leader with a lot of challenges. But I truly believe that if you all who are listening focus on showing up authentically as a real person, showing that you care for others and making sure that you're aligning the people in your organization with your strategic vision and you're doing it together and it's bigger than just one individual, that it's this whole team effort, then then you're good. You're golden, right? So, John, I just can't thank you enough for being with us today. I loved learning from you. It was a true pleasure, Michelle. It's always great to uh, look back at the Saints era and smile and be a part of such great leadership. And Michelle, you could do an entire podcast on that Katrina year and the leadership and the connection that was deepened even stronger because of the relationship and authentic care between the community and the team. Uh, you talk about a, a strong bond before, but an unbreakable bond after. That's what was created, and I'm so grateful to be a part of those you know, very challenging time during Katrina, but also a part of bringing that hope and the joy of the Super Bowl victory back to not only a city, but an entire region that was starving for something to be really positive and, and uh, something that we can be proud of. So great memories and i appreciate the opportunity to kind of share some of the impacts that it's had on me personally thank you oh thank you so much john you were just a fantastic guest and again thank you for our listeners for tuning in and learning more about the seismic shift and how we can all be a part of making workplaces more positive more compassionate kinder and more connected everyone have a beautiful day take care Thank you for joining us on The Seismic Shift. And before you go, can I ask one favor of you? Do you mind sharing today's episode with a leader you know? The power of this conversation is found in your using it and sharing it to create real connection in your life. Lastly, I'd like to thank Loyola University New Orleans and the Terra Firma audio team for helping bring this content to life.